audio sounds good with me keeping it right here. I see some thumbs up. I have to admit, before starting today, it's really intimidating being the talking head up here in Research Park tied to the university with all of you. And so before I begin, I want to say we have one heck of a community, a very strong women in tech. And I'm such a strong believer in that. I stalked most of you on LinkedIn this morning, if you saw me popping up in your feed to try to represent the faces of women across startups, research parks, the university, the park. We just have such a really strong scene here. So before I begin, this day is about women in tech, not women in tech. So I think we should all give ourselves a round of applause, please. All right, now that I've warmed you up with my compliments, I will put the spotlight on myself. Uh, to introduce myself, I'm Jen Quinlan. Um, and my talk for today, the way that I've approached trying to recap the past 20 years of wearing a lot of hats, um, first I'd like to highlight a couple key themes um, in trying to look backwards over the variety of roles that have benefited me and that I hope will benefit you. So up front, I'll start with kind of focusing on those three themes. Um, from there, I'd like to tell you a story, a little bit about what it's been like for me, trying to anticipate what's next and be the right place at the right time from 2005 up through now. <laughs> And then in closing, um, I've, I've been molded by a lot of incredible women in this room. I've picked up on a couple of tips and tricks about ways we can all be advocates to other women in tech and to our male allies here, thank you as well. Um, so I'd like to close with eight skills that we can all leave today and share to elevate other women in this room and other women in the community. Um, so that will be the high level structure of our talk. Um, I guess first, while catching up a little bit with slides, um, or even Emily, if this works well for you, maybe I could drive it from over here, if that sounds okay. <coughs> sure, so I'll, I'll, I'll start, I'll freestyle. I'll start first with uh, the, the top three themes um, that I'm gonna try to cover in today's talk. First would be, tech has changed radically over the past 20 years. Um, I, even when looking backwards, I try to contextualize a little bit of my talk of looking what emerged when, what has really happened over the past 20 years. And if we all jumped in a time machine together today, went back 20 years, and we were trying to convince each other what it would be like now, it would be very difficult to imagine that picture. Thank you so much, I appreciate your help. It would be very difficult to try to imagine that picture. And I'd also dare you, what the heck is it going to be like 20 years in the future? Who knows? <laughs> So let, let's all lean into change, let's embrace it, let's do our best to figure out what's receiving the biggest amount of funding right now, what's really tough and hairy problems, and how can we be at the right place at the right time to make sense of that messy picture. But that's been something I've tried really hard to light my skills on fire multiple times um, to try to ride the wave to whatever's emerging next. The second one, I've been three times startups, one time founding team, um, digital agencies now to the biggest private label company in the United States. So I've seen a lot of different shapes and sizes and companies. But something that always remains to be true, it's really hard to build good products. <laughs> um, exceptionally hard. And good to me equals things that people will buy, that they actually will use. They not only like using, but they love using. And that is really tough. And two functions, time and time again, I see swept underneath the carpet by often engineering and product peers are represented that voice of the marketing perspective, the marketing strategy. How big is that addressable market? And the second of which, who are the people we're serving? And do we serve them well, or where are we missing the mark? So I would just encourage all of us, whether it's formally your role or if these are stretch skills you're leaning into, do make sure UX and marketing are represented. They do a really good job at helping teams navigate through ambiguity to build the right thing. And finally, I'm really scrappy. I've done a lot of stuff. Some people in the room might say, gee, she's a flake. Why do we have a flaky lady up here that's jumped around a lot? So my, my profile that I'm representing is it's okay to jump around. It's okay to do different things. Um, I've worn a lot of different hats and held responsibilities that I officially didn't have the title to do. Um, but in jumping around, rarely have I seen in my career a clear path to get from point A to point B. Um, what I do have now, and I love, I never knew the name for it, but I came across this article in the past week, 
I think a lot of us have career portfolios where we've worked across a variety of company types, formats, industries, <coughs> founder personality types. And I encourage you today to take that time to audit your career and think of it more as a portfolio approach. And that all of that benefit is what you bring to the table when working within your teams. So now, I told you, we, now, now we're stepping into the timeline part of uh, today's talk. And I'd like to take you back to 2005. Guess what? At this point in time, this might shock perhaps some early career friends in the room. Facebook looked like that. It was called the Facebook, which is typically an indicator. Now you don't know what you're talking about, Ted. If you added the on top of the But uh, you had to have a college email address at this point in time. That clunky thing in the bottom is what we used to listen to music, and it could pretty much only hold 20 songs. Um, on top of that, Amazon looked more like Wikipedia. Netflix was a direct mail company. And then that phone was the most high-tech, cutting-edge thing I had. It was pretty fancy to see how it slid open. <laughs> so this was the time. And then at the time, this was the tool. And I don't know about you, but trying to navigate to find the right information at the right time just seemed like magic. I guess Google thought so too, because they had this button called I'm Feeling Lucky to <laughs> transport to some place on the internet, and hopefully it wasn't a, a scandalous place. But um, so I, I had just graduated University of Maryland, went to the Smith School of Business. I was a wannabe designer that got forced to be a business major, but it all worked out. <laughs> and um, I didn't want to move home with my parents, so instead I moved with my best friend's parents in Skokie, Illinois, uh, to jump into the Chicago market. And I got really lucky. Sometimes, when people stand in front of you and claim to be an expert and that they knew what they were doing, I'm here to break that myth. I just got lucky. <laughs> so I ended up at a company that only had 15 employees and I was employee number 16. I was trying to get a roommate, it led to meeting a recruiter, and all of a sudden I passed a remedial media math test, uh, which equaled, we were initially serving mom and pop companies and trying to drive the right traffic to their sites to help their business grow. And all of a sudden at age 21, I had talking roles with corporate VPs at McDonald's and Northwestern Mutual, um, jokingly to make my audience laugh, hopefully, while they finish their lunch. I had to do a search engine marketing strategy on cat litter brands, which makes for some colorful conversations that your peers will laugh at you a lot. Um, but I learned two things here. One, I was way in over my head at this wild startup that was acquired when I was there for the first three months. I had to learn on the fly, I had to step up, and all of a sudden I was talking to people that I perceived as being exceptionally important, much more than my 21-year-old experience. So startups can be an incredible way to stretch beyond your boundaries, take on more that you're prepared to take on, um, but you jumpstart other people that perhaps have a more linear path and more traditional roles. So that was one lesson learned. The second lesson learned for me, hey, I think I'm gonna have a pretty de decent career if I stay in tech. <laughs> So staying within digital and trying to keep that as a path moving forward was the route that I went. Uh, if, probably a lot of you won't recognize this city skyline. Um, it's Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, so I, I followed my then boyfriend, now husband, out to the southwest. I worked for a small uh, marketing consultancy. And uh, in my early 20s, I was named their director of online marketing. Um, I had to interpret for regional brands what was this new social marketing thing? What's Twitter? What is this video stuff going on on YouTube? And to try to help those brands uh, figure out the right way to extend their brand presence in the digital sphere. Um, it was a blast. I laughed. I recently dug up a clip of being on local television early in the morning um, to explain to all Albuquerque residents what Twitter was <laughs> and how they should follow it to learn about hot air balloons. So that was a, a nice uh, time capsule moment looking back. Um, Small companies might be things that those in the room in early career as well might feel like, gosh, you know what, really, these aren't the biggest brands in the world. This was my start, and while they were regional players, they did give me an opportunity to really dive in and make my mark, and it was a safe place to learn. Um, I quickly realized while I was doing great stuff from website management, web development, and graphic design work, it was time to grow. And actually, there was a city called Austin, Texas, some of you might have heard of, that was growing pretty darn fast. So, um, while I made the jump there in 2009, most companies in the United States were moving a lot of their IT and digital teams from other parts of the country down to Texas. So I had the great luxury as far as working across a lot of really exciting brands and then brands that were making that transition. Um, while I was at Springbox, we grew up to about 100 employees. We worked with the Livestrongs and the Dells and the AMDs of the world. 
I still have nightmares about doing global website launches for CPU, GPU combinations. Mm. It was horrible. <laughs> but um, what, while working here for about three years, I was an account lead. I worked on new business. I worked on innovation. What were those projects we wanted to expand our company? And I got pulled up to the management team. Um, and, and as our business evolved, something called the iPhone came out. <laughs> and it quickly became evident that everyone that worked in digital, there was a big shift coming and that we felt very comfortable designing experiences on this wider format desktop experience, but how might we make this fundamentally different as far as being in context with the user while they're roaming their environment, shopping, trying to get the right information at the right time. We did some nascent early experiences in grocery retail, which was a great learning experience, but just really didn't cut it. And we didn't know what we didn't know because we were still building things like we were shipping campaigns. We hadn't made the jump to developing product. I heard about five guys at UT in a dorm room that had started a business, and they were quickly growing. Their business, their first app involved throwing a smartphone in the air to measure how high it went. I bet you they had a lot of iPhone repair bills on that one. Um, some humorous kind of cliche ways to interpret what is this new application space for this new device. And um, when I came in, we were already about 100 people in Mutual Mobile. We ended up scaling the company to about 250 employees between Austin, Texas and Hyderabad, India. Um, my role by title has always been marketing, but my job is to help teams uh, get connected with the right brands to build the right thing. On the nature of the accounts we work with, we help build Google Wallet. Um, we worked on Nike, specifically working on Nike Skate, um, which was extremely exciting. Uh, connected toys. We were putting beacon technology inside children's stuffed animal toys so that way when they came close to iPads, a, a document stuff in story would be revealed that was pertinent to that character. Um, the work was a lot of fun and it really became clear having the right features with the right benefits and products was really different as far as shipping us to campaign in time. Um, I became wearable obsessed. <laughs> so, number one fan girl was, was right here. Um, you don't have to be an expert in a thing to fully dive in and learn it as best as you can. Something's new. It's something I learned very quickly. For those unfamiliar, upper left-hand corner is one of the first Pebble smartwatches. Does anybody have one of these or remember these? No? Okay, well, here's your history lesson and wearables are. Um, between Pebble, initial smartwatch that came out, the Jawbone, um, or early versions of Fitbit, these were popular, popularized everywhere in addition to Google Glass coming out with an initial version. It was absolutely taken off, and brands and companies had no idea how to make sense of this space. Um, I leaned in, encouraged our company to buy every single wearable product that existed, <laughs> and we tested them out. Um, we started taking more of a UX approach. Are they wearable? How do they fit within the context of fashion and the legacy of jewelry? Um, are they actually usable? Does the battery last more than a couple minutes or hours or days? Um, but we studied the products to try to figure out how they were wearable, useful, desirable, or things that people cannot live without. Um, a, a niche of research that I fell into, I started also, I, I was bored with often very fit men being profiled in all these use cases for the new tech. And actually the audience I started focusing on was, how could these products be a game changer, often for people with different abilities? And this was an area of study um, that I was afforded the opportunity to speak at South by Southwest, do some research with some partners at Forrester Research in addition to speaking at CES, which was a, a, a great opportunity. Um, if you've ever had a wearable, you might have found you can game the system, right? Has anybody drank a glass of wine while going like this and putting on some steps, or, <laughs> right? Or, um, or maybe you're walking and you're a fit mom pushing a baby carriage, but your wearable doesn't recognize that you're doing anything because your wrist is stationary, because that's one point of sensing in the body. That's not fair. Um, the more I dug into the products, the more I became very irritated that they were one size fits all, which means they weren't right for anyone. <laughs> and that just did not sit right with me at all. And at this point in time, I was watching a lot of male peers make the jump from mobile software to starting their own startups, and things were starting to take off. Um, and quite frankly, I wanted a piece of the pie to gain that experience myself. So these might look like some familiar faces to Enterprise Works friends in the room. My husband's a townie, go Centennial Baseball, go Baseball Hall at Parkland. He uh, also went to ISU, he's a Redbird, sorry, Illini fans in the house. 
Um, my husband's Italian, we wanted to move back. I didn't know how we were going to do it, to swing it from jumping from Austin back to here. And in fact, briefly working out of that office, um, as Lorette referenced. But um, I ended up attacking the local market by contacting every single VC I could find and uh, virtually knocking on the doors to say, hey, I'm Jen Quinlan. I love building mobile products. I have some decent uh, digital experience. I want to be a future townie, and I'm obsessed with verticals. Who should I talk to? Tell me anyone. I'll track them down. And um, Rob Schultz with Sarah Ventures picked up the phone. <laughs> so he got stuck talking to me, which led to Rob saying, wow, this is really strange that you're reaching out at this point in time. There's this guy, uh, Dr. Prashant Mehta, and his PhD candidate, Adam Tilton, and they're, they're kind of sniffing around the space. In fact, they're participating in a student competition through the COZAD competition right now. I'm trying to make sense of wearables. Um, a couple days went by, all of a sudden, I'm freelance consulting from Austin, first pro bono, then paid. And then, if you ever met Adam, I'd say this to his face, he's a character. He's a very brazen gentleman. <laughs> and um, Adam ended up giving me an ultimatum to say, hey, in or out. Like, you're either 100% in or out. There was no toes in both water with your full-time fancy Austin job. Either move back to Champagne, join the startup as founding team, or don't. Um, so I said yes. Um, which was a great, great decision in a, in a very fun career chapter for me. So, um, as Laura had referenced, and by the way, this is a developer board. It looks wonky. Nobody is intended to actually wear stuff that looks like that. So just, just for reference for those in the audience. What we did, we, we broke math that was really good at making sense of motion sensors and wearables, accelerometers and gyroscopes. And the way that we broke math could kind of recognize what you were doing, and then on top of that, you could teach it your unique form of how you did it, so we could be tailored to your body, tailored to your form, and more accurate, finally. Um, we started first in the Android world market, we weren't quite sure what we wanted to be. We tried being a platform company and also a consumer device company as well. Um, we played in the physical therapy space, but the area that we really gained the most traction is when we started showing up as a consumer-facing fitness brand. So Rhythmio Edge was our consumer-facing fitness brand. Um, what we're seeing with this gentleman, I believe he's doing a kettlebell deadlift for those that weight lift more than I. <laughs> um, as he performs this action, within about three repetitions, our tech can learn what you were doing and then it could quantify the reps that you completed that physical movement through one point of sensing, of course, through the uh, smartwatch. Um, so the user would see the feedback about what they were doing, what's the count of it, and actually, for people that care a lot about fitness, taking away the burden of keeping up with your workout log, digitizing that, automating it, um, was of a lot of interest to a lot of the big fitness brands. So we took the startup really small. Uh, we grew up to about 15 people in total. Uh, briefly dabbled in shipping our own devices, connected clothing as well, um, and briefly took a tour as far as trying to explore um, NSF-funded work in the physical therapy space. Um, Ultimately for us, you know, we, we were playing really closely with fitness brands, we played really closely with semiconductor companies, and we're working on getting on um, a system on chip, focus on the wearable space, but Bosch ended up being where we landed. Um, so small exit, but hey, we, we still exited um, to Bosch, and this is a photo of a um, pretty close to our final team at that point in time. Um, final chapters is a townie now. Um, I, I had a brief stint at Hobby Co. and Tower Hobbies. I had bad luck. I caught them at the wrong chapter at the wrong time. But here's one thing I'd like to say. Um, sometimes in your career, the work that might not seem to be the most sexy can actually be the most impactful. And what I found, within a month after joining this company, I learned they were entering Chapter 11, which was not fun news, <laughs> but had a great legacy, and there were a lot of jobs we wanted to protect in this local market. So my job ended up being digital turnaround initiatives. So I worked across a portfolio of 40 brands, did everything I could to do turnaround initiatives on their e-commerce presence. Um, and I also stepped up to be more of a UX professional. Um, this product, anybody ever use a selfie stick in the room? This was our attempt to do the drone version of that. So uh, one example of a product we touched was a selfie drone. And uh, our engineering team, our Chinese space manufacturing team, focused very much on uh, trying to make this something that every consumer will want to buy. However, it was built by people that uh, really came from the hobbyist space. It was a very cumbersome product. Um, my role 
was not liked very much. So as we debuted at CES and we were getting ready to ship to market, my job was to be the voice of the customer to break the bad news. If you use a selfie stick, how many seconds would it take perhaps to take a selfie? Two, three, maybe something like that, or even just holding up your phone? Our process, unfortunately, from unboxing this product took two and a half hours before you could take the first photo. <laughs> as far as calibrating the device, learning the controls, making it past training modules, I mapped out every single task a person had to do, and I ended up with this PDF artifact that was like 15 pages long, documenting the entire process. So again, even if you don't officially have a UX professional on your product team, it's really nice for someone to play that role to speak the honest truth about the status of some of our products. And one other one, again, and I just wanted to highlight this, because not all of our professional experiences Nike skate, right? Um, I had the opportunity, which I love, this is one of my favorite products I've ever done. Um, Tower Hobbies, uh, their e-commerce site, would do, I mean, about three to five million dollars a month in gross revenue through their website. The website's checkout process hadn't been touched since 2007. And it was 100% built in-house. There was no fancy e-commerce platform that fueled it. And it was only catered towards desktop. So this microscopic hand with this microscopic screen is exaggeratedly blurry. But that's basically what the user experience was when you went to the site and 45% of their site traffic was mobile. What a missed opportunity. So um, my job was to act as a product owner, a UX lead, and a project manager to work with two in-house engineers. And in three months, we gutted the old process, redesigned it, unlocked guest checkout, shipped a mobile optimized experience, and then I think the numbers speak for itself as far as the legend revenue we were seeing just in the first few months. So there's a lot of variables you can't control in your career as far as the company's health, um, but you sure, certainly, I found, can fight to find meaningful work to protect your teams and protect your companies when you're there. Um, I, for another year in town, Mishir is a local company also based out of Shenzhen. Um, I worked with them after Hobbyco, uh, another one of their house brands with their hardware arm is called Zmoto. Um, you could think of them as an additional brand as far as like the ring doorbells of the world. Um, one project I'd like to highlight again, just to emphasize, create space for your design and marketing friends. I had one month, we often would interact with people that wanted to create smart home products. And I had one month to work with an uh, international lighting company called Hubble, and they said, Here's our current lighting unit. Here's your base camera. Can you guys figure out, one month from now, before we go to our big trade show, how to fit this and that? Make it work. I think this is a really nice talent story, too. I ended up working with Stacy Osterber, which is a local guy I worked with at Hobby Co, who self-taught CAD. Um, we ended up taking the measurements and the guts, the inside of the camera, to design a retrofitted casing that we 3D printed in Ogden at Shapemaster with Kevin Cooley, who's lovely. Uh, and we've re-skinned our main app, our smartphone, um, our, our application for smart home to be able to monitor video clips from the device. Um, so this is a one month process as far as taking a concept to feasibility analysis, analysis to discovering it, and mocking up and making it real. And it worked. Like you, you can now partner with Hubble, and this is the end product that exists in market that I discovered when I was blowing the dust off of some of these previous career chapters. So to wrap up, I want to highlight briefly a little bit about Cargill, and um, then we'll close with kind of those eight tips about how to be an advocate for each other. So as Laura said, I am a set director here in Cargill. If you're unfamiliar, I like to joke, after farmer grows a thing, up to food is on your fork is where we play. I'm um, so a big, giant, global company. Um, massive player in the food and the ag industry. Uh, the lab I run is a prototype lab. So my job is, in the past four years, we shipped 90 different prototypes over that course of time where a stakeholder has an idea and we have to take it from concept to reality in about 14 weeks. It's mayhem and I love it. <laughs> so, um, I've, I've profiled four projects just to give a feel it's rare um, you know, within a company like Cargill to be able to kind of peek behind the scenes to show what we're doing. So one example, uh, this is a startup called Rescued. Cargill has an initiative to create intrapreneurs or um, entrepreneurs from within the company as opposed to additionally um, investing or acquiring in external companies. In this case, we realize the food suppliers of the world, the Cisco's of the world, sometimes they have excess supply. And not a little of it, a lot of it, like giant dumpsters of it. <laughs> and today, 
They put all that excess food that's imperfect or expiring soon, or just even just have too much um, directly in the dumpster, which incurs fees. And let's face it, that's pretty stupid considering the amount of uh, hunger we have uh, across our, our planet today. So um, we've been working behind the scenes with the startup team for the past year and a half with students from the University of Illinois, representing our UX/UI design function. We've done everything from defining who they should go after, who could be the buyers of this excess supply food. Guess what? Private chefs are too small to have access to food suppliers, food trucks, um, regional um, food stores as well, and also hunger-related nonprofits. Um, they shop at perhaps the Costco's today, but they don't have access to the major suppliers to buy like quality meat in bulk. Um, so this is the startup we launched. It was featured at South by Southwest, and it's a partnership between Cargill and Google that we've been working on. I love this one. I think this one is ridiculous, and I love it, and I'm proud to talk about it. So we, um, Cargill has 160,000 employees worldwide, substantial consumer insights group. No one in Cargill does social listening tailored to Gen Z, except us. So one niche area that my lab has expanded into, every fast food restaurant, our latest chicken sandwich, be something that's the must-have item that someone much younger than us will want to buy. Um, I saw this as a big opportunity after hearing this pattern emerge in a couple of calls. I faked that we had a Gen Z social listening lab, and it paid off. <laughs> um, we ended up flipping our marketing interns to be market researchers. Um, we started studying parts of the industry that pertain to our customer portfolio, and then um, we presented directly to Taco Bell, Burger King, McDonald's, um, global consumer insights leads to fuel these TikTok-derived patterns into their product innovation roadmap. So this has been a blast, plus it makes me very hungry. Um, so I enjoy snacking on some of these hacked items. But I mean, this is from a while ago, but little things are actually big things. As far as realizing that people are buying burritos and drenching them um, in sauce and by requesting a bowl on the side to prepare and enjoy it that way, and view that as a different menu item to unique, um, to unique frozen drink concoctions, um, it has just been a, a treasure trove of data and insights that our team's been able to um, structure. All right, this one I know is not the most aesthetically pleasing UI, but one thing that's funny, I know I referenced earlier, you will be surprised when you have a broad career portfolio how things you've learned in the past will come back. When we were tasked in Canada with all of the poultry farmers to be able to digitize how they enter data from pen and paper to be a mobile tool, we didn't know where to start. There wasn't really a parallel. What do we pull from? I hate to say this, but consumer fitness. My Rhythmio days came back. So you may notice that the key welfare's indicators UI actually looks a lot like a fitness log as far as posting um, repetitions of workouts or summaries or rolled up views. So it's been really fascinating, even with an Argo, cargo with a big ag and big food, to be referencing patterns from problems we solved in the past from wildly different spaces. So um, I would encourage everyone, um, your, your previous career chapters absolutely matter. And then my final example, to just give you a taste of what we're doing now, smart manufacturing has been a big growth area for us uh, within the company. So I've been partnering with our research and development team. We're exploring ways um, to produce products more efficiently, keep people safe, um, and increase our yields. Uh, one recent project, um, which actually there's a a woman data scientist in my lab right now and that's working on this problem. Um, we're leveraging cameras in, cameras in facilities to analyze the effectiveness, say, of someone cutting a New York strip steak. There's a certain technique involved. Um, there's certain safety elements that are involved about knife sharpening or the direction of your knife that you would leave it on the table. Um, but this has been an area that we're starting to imply uh, big AI computer vision, cameras on facility to unlock personalized coaching. Um, to try to help a manager be all places at all times to give people the right insights so we can um, keep people safe and drive the highest yield. So that's been an exciting um, recent chapter. Well, we're reaching time, so let's close. Um, one final quote I'd like to leave you with. If you think the design is expensive, you should look at the cost of bad design. <laughs> um, I, I encourage everybody to try to advocate for those functions on your own product teams. So final thoughts, eight ways to support women in tech. And I hope that some of these are your things that you do or skills that you can take from you today to um, support your, your female peers. One, as I open with, I felt like an imposter being up here. I imagine those in the audience feel like being an imposter. Let's cut that out. Okay, so as much today as we could just let the imposter syndrome go, 
Let's name it, let's bury it, let's stop doing it. No matter when I talk to C-levels and company, all the way down to the new intern that's still at UIUC, everybody feels like a phony, everyone feels stupid. It's okay. So I just wanted to out myself, I encourage you to out yourself in meetings as well. It's more important to recognize that we're gonna stay curious and keep learning, and we should feel stupid because we're continually pushing the envelope. So no more imposter syndrome for us ladies. Second of all, keep showing up, someone's watching, right? Maybe someone has never seen a female manager. Maybe someone has never seen a female team lead or an innovation lab lead. And the more that you show up, the more that you normalize this, this is normal. I've been the only woman in meetings most of my career. I've never had a female boss. Up until this year, as a first time professionally, I've even had a female on the org chart of the entire company higher than me, okay? I've been patted on the head and asked to go get coffee when I was the VP of innovation in meetings, and that's just the PG rated stories I have to tell. So. Today is about celebrating our representation, not digging up old dirt, but keep showing up, someone's watching, representation matters. Build a tribe. I have some of my closest gal pals here. Um, keep building bridges with other smart, talented ladies. I, I hope over the course of lunch, maybe you met someone new, um, but even on the toughest days, that's a great way to keep cheering this on. Um, th this one has been a tough lesson to learn, but I just wanted to pass it on. I encourage all of you to think you are your own manager, okay? So no one is responsible for your career development except for you because you can't put that much pressure on someone else. And I hate to say it, but a lot of managers aren't very good. <laughs> so I, I just encourage everyone to embrace the mindset. How frustrating would it be for a talented woman in tech for her progression to be thwarted because someone else was a crummy manager that didn't open doors? So surprise, you're your own best manager and it's great. You can build skills to manage up with your official bosses but you are fully have the authority to augment their deficiencies with finding mentorship other places to be your own best advocate. That's worked really well for me to just assume that. Um, redefine your career success at every stage. <clears throat> hey, 22 year, year old me, I mean, there was free food in the office. That was success, you know, for someone that was pretty broke in Chicago. Um, in my late 20s, I was trying as fast as I could to hit a VP title and see if I could do that by 30. That was success. Um, I've always wanted to have Under Armour's account, like since I was in college, and Kevin Plank, you know, spun his company out of uh, out of Baltimore University, Maryland. However, you define su success at each age is great, um, but you fully have the authority to redefine it as often um, as you need to to fit you at that specific life stage. So know the game that you're playing. And to wrap up, we're going to stop at eight. I promise. Um, advocate for others. To me, I, I've had to be the person to enforce company policy. Um, to call out things that were unjust and unfair. Um, I've had to develop a style to meet certain peers where they were maturity-wise to help them evolve their skills. Um, but we have an accountability to other people in the place of work. And then I would encourage you, something I'd love to see at Cargill that we presently have, we have women-focused resource groups to pull together all of the information and make it easier for women to find the right content at the right time. So that's, that's something I've really enjoyed seeing in a much larger organization. And final two thoughts, let's all become obsessed with sharing the skills that help people get ahead. It, I've been guilty of this. Um, I've had certain jobs that I didn't counter-negotiate. I've had, um, which leads to over time, if, you, if you've developed that bad habit when you're 21, by the time you're 40, my age, that's a compounded salary gap over time. Um, but if we could all leave today to learn how can we better negotiate, how can we build better skills to advocate for ourselves, and the data tells us women are less likely to apply to a job if they don't meet 100% of the required bullet points on that posting, okay? And data also tells us that male counterparts typically do apply even if they only meet about 50 or 60% of that criteria. That's going to be a big problem over time. So I'm sharing this data with you, become obsessed with it, and um, in my lab, with every intern that's a senior, I offer to write their counter negotiation letters back to their prospective <laughs> employer, so watch out. <laughs> but do, do you teach a skill? I, I had the pleasure, I taught one of my past interns a skill. I gave her a template and I proved her counter offer letter. She ended up getting a couple thousand dollars more and was filled with joy. She taught her roommates a skill. Um, so the more that we can build these skills and share it with other peers and other women, um, it, it helps us all rise. And then finally, these events are awesome. Um, this is a great way for us just to put the spotlight on each other, learn from each other. Um, 
one of our successes is not not another woman's loss, which is how weirdly I was brainwashed, you know, in elementary through high school. But um, I think we're, we're not competing, we're just seeking ways to support each other and elevate each other's stories. Um, so I just encourage everyone to try to find ways every day, every week, uh, to call out, acknowledge, and celebrate other women, uh, women in management, women in leadership, and women in tech. So that concludes my talk. Thank you so much for your time.